Thank you. One of the most remarkable features of our lives is how connected we all are, how connected we are together and with people across the globe. Every, every aspect of our social, our cultural, and our economic lives is interconnected. Consider the clothes you're wearing today. Where were they made? Where did they come from? Think of the food that you ate. Where was it grown? Consider the technology that you use to stay connected with your family, with your friends. The flights that you take to visit different parts of the globe. We are entirely connected. Our Global civilization depends upon the flows of energy, of information, uh, of commodities, and that's what defines our society. Take a look at, at this image. This is a stunning picture. This is the signature of human connectivity across the globe. You can see in yellow that the, the yellow points represent our urban centers, our cities. You can see they're connected in blue by the shipping routes, in white by the airways and the air network and in green by the global network of roads. They span the six continents that you can see on this image. It's remarkable. This connectivity defines our time. But whilst we connect our societies at ever-increasing paces, we are disconnecting nature. This is the, the flip side of what we're doing as we connect our society. We convert the, cover, the, the land cover. We're converting the surface of the land to make space for the food we need to eat, to develop the cities and the transport networks that define our connectivity. What you see here are snapshots of forest fragmentation. Forests are typically the first things that get um, removed to make space for our lives. What you see here are two features of forest fragmentation. You see lots of fragments here to the left tiny islands of forest in a sea of agriculture. And to the right, you'll notice that we create these edges, that the forest is directly in contact with human activity. And this process of deforestation and fragmentation erodes our ecosystems. It erodes the biodiversity, and it makes them less resilient. But it's difficult to get a sense of the effects of fragmentation and how the process of fragmentation unfolds from a photo. So let me show you a video of that, a short 40-year history of the process of fragmentation that will happen in the central Amazon, in a state in Brazil called Rondonia. And over 40 years, there was uh, the loss of 70,000 kilometers squared of forest. So I'm going to show you. You'll see we're going to zoom in, thanks to technology from NASA. We're going to zoom in to Rondonia. Look out for the top right-hand corner of the image, where you'll see a road that makes an incursion into the area. Look at the top right. And what you'll see is a fishbone pattern of deforestation. As the road comes in, the forest is cleared for farms and for ranches, and we create this sea of isolated fragments of forest. This pattern of fragmentation is disconnecting nature. This is how we disconnect nature. But how important is this? Is it, is it universal? Is it a global phenomenon? Or does it only happen in the Amazon? Well, um, Joe Sexton and his colleagues at the University of Maryland and a, and a big team of global fragmentation scientists that I'm part of have tried to calculate how the scale of fragmentation on planet Earth. It turns out that right now, 70% of the world's forests are within a kilometer of an edge, of a human edge. 70%. And 20% of those forests are within 100 meters of human activity. So global fragmentation is here. It's widespread. It's happening in the boreal forest. It's happening in the tropics. It's happening in Southeast Asia, Africa, and South America. So this, is, this disconnection of nature is a real phenomenon that opposes human connectivity. This opposition, this antagonism between human connectivity and nature's connectivity is what I call the connectivity paradox. We need human connectivity. It defines our society. But we also need ecological connectivity because it's what makes the biosphere um, resilient. And so this connectivity paradox is, is something that's made up of a threshold. We call it a tipping point when, when sudden events happen, when we pass through a threshold of human connectivity, we see the collapse of ecological connectivity. And this nonlinear shape here makes it difficult to predict when we've gone too far in our own human connectivity. 
And we have to be able to predict when that'll happen so that we can better manage and restore our ecological connectivity for our well-being. So what are the, some of the consequences of this collapse of ecological connectivity? What, is it, what does it mean for us and for our ecosystems? Well, fragmentation scientists like myself, over decades and decades, have been studying the impacts of forest fragmentation. We do whole ecosystem experiments. Right? Physicists accelerate particles to sublight speeds, round and round and round. Well, fragmentation ecologists study what happens if you create whole ecosystem fragments. And we study the patterns of biodiversity change, and we study the patterns of uh, stability of the system and the capacity of an ecosystem to absorb stress. So what you see here is a typical pattern of what happens as we lose species through time after we isolate a fragment. So you'll see that it happens over decades, and that often we lose maybe half, as much as 90% of the species that are inhabiting those forest fragments. And this is happening globally. But there is some good news. We know from research in my lab at McGill University and from other labs around the world that if you reconnect forest fragments, if you reconnect nature, you can recover that biodiversity, you can recover the resilience of those ecosystems, and you can make them more adaptive so that they can readjust and rebound in the face of environmental stress. So this would suggest that we can work on ecological connectivity, not only for nature's sake, but for our sakes. We benefit from connectivity to nature when our children don't spend enough time in nature. Right? They have problems holding their attention, problems of obesity, depression. They don't use their senses. Their senses are not stimulated enough. This idea of nature deficit disorder is a cost of isolating our society from nature. But we also know that when you look at urban societies across different income groups, that there are effects on our own adult cardiovascular health, our mental health. And so it's essential that we maintain connected to nature as a society. So, connectivity science is a, is a mature science, it's profound, and it's potentially practical. We can potentially use it to reconnect nature and to, and to try to mitigate some of the negative impacts of human connectivity. That's what we want to do. That's what I want to do as a researcher. So how can we solve this connectivity paradox? Right? We're in a situation where potentially our ecosystems and our societies are at tipping points, and we want to be able to prevent that from happening. About three years ago, I received a very scary phone call that was essentially inviting me out of my safe ivory tower. I got a phone call from the Quebec government that said, Andy, we've been looking at your research on connectivity science. We'd really like you to try and solve the problem of forest fragmentation and biodiversity loss around the city of Montreal. We'd like you to come up with a plan. Could you design a network for this city of 3.5 million people and a region of 22,500 square kilometers? And I remember staggering, thinking I hadn't had enough coffee that morning. And I was thinking, sure, let me, I'll knock that up for you in a few hours. Uh, and um, I, remember, I don't really rem remember much of the, the details of that phone call after that point, because I was, I was struck by the scale of what I was being asked to do. I had created this, this worldview of you know, connectivity science. I was happy in my worldview in my ivory tower. I mean, now I was being asked to apply it. And uh, that was scary. I felt like this problem was a juggernaut, right? And I was the deer caught in the headlights of this juggernaut. So I took the day to think about it, uh, had more coffee, and, uh, and it turns out that I decided, you know what? I've been working on this connectivity science for 15 years, right? I think it's profound, but I think it's practical. If I'm not going to do it, if I'm not going to make a first stab at providing a solution to the connectivity paradox, then who is going to do it, right? I, at some point, you have to step to the plate. So that's what we did, and that was about three years ago, and we got some funding for that from the government, and a big team of postdocs and graduate students in my lab at, uh, at McGill decided to come up with a solution. And so the plan, just to remind you, was to reconnect our region. This is where we live. This is the city of Montreal, three and a half million people. This is the, the St. Lawrence River flowing around our island, and this light green is the sea of agriculture, right, where you grow soy and maize and corn, and we grow pigs, and we, do, we use that landscape intensively. And you can see in dark green are the forest fragments that we want to connect for our society and for our ecosystems. So 
Only 1% of this territory is protected right now. So it's not a question we can just say tomorrow, let's protect 20%. We have to be more clever. We have to design this network from the bottom up. And this is what our landscape typically looks like. If you drive east, right, you quickly enter fields of soy, and you'll see forest fragments scattered in the landscape. How important are those fragments? How important is each fragment to the, to the connectivity of the whole, of the whole region? We don't know the answer to that. No one asked that question. I can tell you, though, that if you take all the small fragments, just the fragments of 10 hectares only, they store as much carbon as all the carbon dioxide emitted by the city of Montreal per year. So they're incredibly important just from the point of view of carbon. But they're also incredibly important from the point of view of the whole suite of species, the biological diversity that occupies this landscape, that inhabits this landscape with us. So to answer that question, we need to know how each species perceives the value of that forest fragment, how easily it can move through the landscape from fragment to fragment, and how it uses that landscape for its daily lives, for its reproduction, its ability to move and sustain its populations. But biodiversity is not just a luxury. Biodiversity does stuff. It's part of the processes of, of, of ecosystems, of our landscapes. So we also wanted to evaluate how important each fragment was from the point of view of the benefits that we get from those ecosystems. So it's not just a question of improving biodiversity, but we want to store more carbon, we want to uh, increase the rates of pollination, because as you may know, bees are declining globally, we want to improve water quality, air quality, and we want to minimize the spread of new and emerging diseases like Lyme disease. That's great, that's also important. Turns out that if you do the calculation to the Suzuki Foundation and Jérôme Duprat calculated that the market value of all of this good stuff here is $4.3 billion per year. That's what it would cost our society to replace all of those good things. So that's our natural capital. And I want to use connectivity science to maintain that natural capital, as well as the species that make those processes work. So our lab got together and we did some brainstorming, more coffee, and we came up with three design principles. This is what our network should look like, which is what the properties it should have. It should be connected so that species and people can move freely through it, right? And also to allow species that want to move from the south to the north under climate change. So that's an important property. We want it to be adaptive. We want this network to function in the future when the climate may be two, three, four degrees warmer. So we have to think about the adaptability of that network and the forest fragments that compose it. And we want it to be robust. We want it to be too robust to the possibility that planned or unplanned cutting or loss of forest fragments allow it to work. So we design, we're designing this ecological network with these features. And after three years of, of work, students in the field measuring fragments and the processes in, in, the, in, the, in the ecological process that are going on in the landscape, turning the, the mathematical crank, the, making the computers whir and work, and applying the mathematics that takes into account all the different contributions or the components that make up the value of forest fragment, we came up with a map. I want to show two maps today, just two, that summarize our work to date. And these are the things we've communicated to the government and to NGOs and to our partners who are working to reconnect this landscape. So here is, here is the Montreal in the middle. You've got the St. Lawrence River flowing around it. Each 30 by 30 meter pixel has a value based on its contribution to connectivity. So if it's dark green, that means that fragment has high value. If it's red, that means there is low connectivity. It's very hard for life to traverse those regions. So obviously, if you're in the middle of an agricultural uh, zone, most organisms have trouble making their way through it. And so you'll see that there are regions of high connectivity, forest fragments that are making a big contribution to biodiversity and ecosystem services, and others that are not. If you wanted to, you can download this map from our webpage, and you can put it into Google Earth, and you can zoom in to your backyard, or your nearest recreation, your park, or your playing field, and you can look to see the contribution of that fragment of green space to the overall region. But I don't want to spend too much more time exploring this, I want to point out just one take-home message from this map, and that is you'll see those, that dotted line, or those two dotted lines, encompass a region of high connectivity, a corridor, if you like, of connectivity to the north of the city. 
So this is what exists today. It's our natural zone or natural highway of ecological connectivity. And what I wanted to communicate to the government is that we need to act now to preserve that. Right? We need to build on that, but that's the, the, the focal point for our connectivity. So first of all, we do have connectivity. It's there. We need to use it. But will it be there in the future? Right? Business as usual scenario for Montreal. We have urban sprawl. We pass from 3.5 million to 5 million people. We intensify our uh, agriculture. What will happen? Well, we ran the models. We ran scenarios of the future, a bit like climate scientists do, but we did it for land use change. And this is what the map looks like in 2050. Capture that image and now compare it. So hopefully you, you'll have seen that we have lost a lot of the dark green. We've lost many of the fragments that are making a, a powerful contribution to the connectivity of our landscapes because they're being cut, because climate change is changing the overall permeability of the landscape. So now we have much less connectivity, assuming business as usual, assuming we do nothing about it, this, is the, this will be our region. We still have that corridor to the north, you can see that it's now eroded, there are fewer fragments, and it's there, but probably not good enough. So an important message is that we need to anticipate what's coming down the line. We need to manage our region by design. We need to connect our landscape by design. We, we already do this for our road networks, right? We do this for our rail networks. We do this for our uh, trade networks. Let's do it for nature. So, we can apply connectivity science. I did come out of the ivory tower. We did make it work. It's a work in progress. There are several years of, of work to be done now, and we're working with the government to vision Montreal's green belt as an ecological network. Gone are the days where we think of a green belt as this sort of halo of green space that we protect and we don't use. We have to live with nature. So we, a network is a better vision for how to do that. And we can, I think, if we work city by city, we can solve the connectivity paradox. All of the methods and the tools that our team has developed are out there, are free to use. We were sharing them on the internet. So that potentially anybody can design a network like this for their city and for their landscape. We want to make these solutions accessible to all. Why is that important? Because by 2050, 70% of the world's 9 billion people are going to be living in cities. They're going to be living in cities, and for the most part, there's not enough green space. So if we restore ecological connectivity, we better connect human connectivity and ecological connectivity, then we will make the people who live in those cities happier, healthier, and more prosperous, but we'll make the ecosystems in those cities more resilient, more productive, more species-rich. Right? And by doing that, we are making our collective and connected futures much, much better. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>